Welcome. All right, now it works. Okay. Yeah, so uh, welcome to our talk about uh, vulnerability analysis of endpoint management and monitoring solutions. Um, so this is Dennis. As Oli already said, mm -hmm. I'm Fabian. Uh, we both work as, at ENW as security researchers and analysts. And yeah, we brought you some uh, vendor statements on the solutions we are talking about today. I hope you can read it. So I will read out some of the most important ones. So we have a lot of promising features here. We have stuff like remote control, patch management, we have self-service, we have, have imaging and OS deployment, there's antivirus, it's easy to use, it's extendable. So there's really a lot of really nice features. So let's have a look today how this works and what about security. Okay, but first uh, let's start with a little disclaimer. Uh, we are both actually not really experts on those solutions, so we never set up or operated those solutions in a production environment. We basically just set up a lab environment and did some security research. Um, so we did around two to three weeks of research per product, and we will show you four products today in this talk, but we also looked at additional products that did not get into this talk. We also cannot even show all the vulnerabilities we found for those four products. It's just too much for this talk. Um, all the vulnerabilities we have found, we have also responsibly disclosed to the respective vendors, and according to the vendors, all the vulnerabilities have been fixed so far. Okay, so um, we will start with a short definition of what we understand under endpoint management and monitoring solutions, and then dive into the vulnerability analysis part. Um, this is the technical part of the talk where we'll also have some demos for you so that you can get a better impression of uh, those vulnerabilities and their impact, uh, especially when chained together. And afterwards, we try to summarize those findings, try to identify repeating patterns and issues, and then also have some uh, recommendations, both for the corporations that are using those products and also for the vendors and developers selling those products. Okay, so endpoint management and monitoring solutions. Um, basically, an endpoint can be any system in your network. Uh, mainly, we are talking about servers, uh, also end-user systems like workstations and laptops and so on. But depending on the solutions, this can basically be anything, even a mobile phone and so on. And we are only talking about commercially available products, which actually advertise all of those features that you just saw, uh, complete all-in-one solutions that are distributed software suites here. Um, and yeah, some examples would be uh, SolarWinds and Central, Kaseya, Blade Logic. There's many more. Um, we will also have some more here on uh, this talk. So the thing that got us interested in those solutions in the first place was their complex feature set, basically. Uh, you already saw some of those features. Task automation and software rollouts and all this stuff done across multiple network zones can be quite complicated. Also, when you have multi-tenant capabilities, um, it's, it's getting more complex. And it also requires the operators or the, the company that's using those products um, to do some pretty heavy things like running proprietary software on all the systems. We usually refer to this software piece that is running on all the systems as agents. And those agents run with pretty high privileges um, because they have to manage the system, obviously, and also they need to have firewall clearances so that they can communicate with a central instance. And yeah, it gets pretty, pretty heavy. And also, everyone's promising that this is also easy to use still. So we will see uh, what that means. OK, so what we have here is um, an example architecture, how this could look like on a network level. Um, so that's just some arbitrary example. There's a lot of flavors in which these solutions come, but this could be an example. What we have here is the network zones A, B, and C, all in the corporate network. And uh, the red server symbol in the middle is the central component of a solution. And you have those uh, smaller um, black servers that are endpoints or agent systems. And what you commonly have is that the central solution is placed in another network zone like the DMZ or just a special privileged network zone, but is able to speak to all the agents in other, uh, other, other zones. Also, sometimes the agents are allowed to speak to the central component, which is another zone. We also sometimes have it that the agents can communi communicate with each other on a special port. And it's also possible that the solutions support internet access. Internet access, access well, sorry. So um, 
for example, if you have mobile users that have a smartphone or you have people in home office roaming, stuff like that. So yeah, basically the network, the, the, the uh, central component is reachable by a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's let's take a look at the technical part, uh, the vulnerability analy analysis. So first of all, um, we speak about Nagios Xi. Um, I think a lot of you know that solution. For those who, of you who don't, Nagios Xi is a monitoring solution. So the idea is that you deploy agents on end user systems and servers, and you can get nice graphs that show you the um, performance of the systems, patch level, and stuff like that. And this is really in default settings at least, just a monitoring solution. So it has a really minimized attack surface, and so we focused on compromising the central component, the Nagios Xi server. Um, the server exposes a, a dashboard on port 443. That's just where the administrator logs in and can uh, see different stats. So I brought you a screenshot of an example dashboard. This is what it looks like. Um, you have several systems there over network zones, and you can just gather some stats. And yeah, we will now start out with the demo because um, just imagine you're an operator and you're logged into your Nagios C instance and you get an email. And that email says, hey, Mr. Operator, do you like kitties? And you are like, of course I like kitties. And you click the link. Okay, so. Oh, shit, my video thing must be popping up on the end. Oh, okay, just a second. Yeah, this looks better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so here on the left, we have our Nagios Xi dashboard. It's empty now because we don't have test systems here, but it's still a normal instance. And on the left, we have um, an attacker on the internet somewhere that has this reverse shell, uh, this reverse handler open. And we are logged in, and we got this link from the attacker that's just a, a nice cat picture and the link that promises more kitties. And now, if we click on this link, then you see that there's a connection on the attacker uh, PC. And what we actually have here is that, as you can see, we are now connected to the Nagios C server, the IP match, and we are now the user, oh, that's kind of bad. Okay, and we are now the user Nagios on this Nagios C server, and all this by just the operator clicking one malicious link. Okay, so what happened here? Um, Okay, what we just saw was uh, the chaining of two CVEs in Nagios Xi. So first of all, an XSS, and also an authenticated RCE in the web interface. And together, this results in single-click RCE on Nagios Xi instances. Um, I will skip the XSS for now, because that's just not so cool. Um, but for the RCE, we brought you the, the endpoint that was vulnerable. What you see here is that we are talking to the Ajax helper.php file. This basically is the file that handles all requests for the dashboard. There's a lot of functions in it and it's really complex. But we use the submit command. Oh, do we have a laser pointer? Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, we you, you use uh, the submit command, uh, command and we have some options there. We have this command with the num, okay, it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't work as well, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and we have this command code 1132 that we are targeting, and then in the end, y y the last argument, the CMD data looks kind of suspicious, it's also red, um, and there's backticks in it, and this is a command injection. So basically there was a command injection in one of the basic Ajax helper functions, but how? So. What they did was this. So when you take user input, you always want to validate and filter input. And they did filter input, but as you may recognize, this filtering function is not sufficient for PHP or system calls in the background. This is just for finding pass traversals, and they just didn't think about um, command injections. So yeah, that's how it slipped and how we could get code execution there. Um, yeah. Um, this uh, command 1132 was the command run check command, and this actually was not the only command that was vulnerable to exactly this issue. We actually found a list of commands that had all had this issue. Um, yeah. So that's it for um, being a normal user on Nagios. Now let's talk about getting root. 
Yes, because as you have seen, when we chain those two vulnerabilities, we have now a shell as the Nagios user, which is not the root user on the system. So we need a privilege escalation. And uh, after looking around on the system, up for a while, we found the sudoers file and the following entry inside the sudoers file, which basically says that the Nagios user is allowed to run this backup script um, without providing any password as the root user. So the backup script would be a pretty interesting attack surface. What we also found is that the file ownership on the system was quite a bit inconsistent. So there's a lot of files owned by root and others owned by Nagios. Uh, as you remember, the, the web server runs as Nagios, but all these administrative scripts run as root. Um, so this looks that there could be something wrong um, when the developer does not pay attention enough. So we traced down this backup script. And at some point, the backup script invokes PHP and calls this import XI config uh, PHP file, which itself then includes another PHP file, config.ink.php. And again, another PHP file gets included, the db.ink.php file. And now we are at the following situation where the backup script includes a bunch of files, and we arrive at the file which is owned by the user Nagios. And so we, with a Nagios shell on the system already, can edit this file, inject malicious source code, like malicious PHP code that spawns us a root shell, and then just execute sudo backup xi.sh, and we get a root shell. Um, so this would be basically the privilege escalation, and combined with all the other vulnerabilities we already have, we can then build a single-click root RCE, basically. All right, and this can um, basically then be used to completely compromise the Nagios XI server. OK, that's it for Nagios. Let's continue with uh, the next solution, which is SolarWinds and Central. Yeah, so SolarWinds and Central is um, a lit little more mightier than just monitoring. It's an MSP, so a managed service provider. The idea here is that you, as an IT company, you sell support to other IT support to other companies. And you buy such an MSP solution, and you deploy your agents on the company networks of your customers, and then you manage all, the cu all your customer networks from your central, monitor uh, central solution, management solution in this case. So this MSP is a product that is intended for multi-tenant use, and it's also intended to offer remote control, patch management, antivirus backups, everything. So basically, this is full control of the client's network. And also a disclaimer here, so we are talking about SolarWinds MSP today because when we found this stuff, it was still SolarWinds MSP, but um, they rebranded to enable uh, in between. So yeah, that's the new logo, that's the new name, just so you know what you're talking about. Um, and yeah, they have an interesting statement um, on their security white paper, which says, the SolarWinds and Central server is designed and secured so that it may be placed directly on the internet. However, the recommenda recommended best practice is to place it in a restricted internet zone, such as the DMZ. Uh, yeah, that's a bold statement, and let's put that to the test. <laughs> All right. Um, so we see that the following ports are being exposed to the internet, which is for one SSH, port 22, which is used for um, a tunneling protocol, actually, for remote control sessions, not as the remote control protocol itself. Uh, I will go on deeper into that on the next slide. Then we have HTTP, which is used for, again, a web interface to operate the solution, and also for communicating with the agents, so the agents also communicate with a web API. And then we have another interesting port, which is 10,000, also HTTP, by the way, uh, the end central administration console, the NAC, and we will also see some interesting stuff on that later. So let's talk about this tunneling. Um, so uh, think of the following scenario. We have an operator who wants to take control, like remote administration, on the client system where the end central agent is running on. And those two systems do not have to be in the same network. They can even be both roaming on the internet. Uh, as long as they both can connect to the end central server. And for this, we built this uh, tunnel. So the operator starts by logging into the web interface and starts the remote control session. And the end central server will then um, deploy a temporary private SSH key to the uh, system with the agent running on. And this SSH key is basically allowed to log into the end central server on port 22. Um, it's not allowed to run any system commands or get an interactive SSH shell. It's only allowed to do port forwardings. So what the agent then does is run this SSH command where uh, we do a remote port forwarding of the local SSH port 22 to the end central server uh, on some higher port. In this example, it's 1234. 
Um, and the operator does the same thing with a local SSH port forwarding, uh, forwarding this port, 1234, to its own system on another port, say, 2222. Um, and after this, we have a complete tunnel via SSH, which can then be used uh, by the operator to connect to the client system with an SSH client. So the SSH client will just connect locally to this port, which gets forwarded all the way to the SSH server on the client system. And this solution is actually not restricted to use SSH as a remote control protocol. You can basically just swap out the SSH client and SSH server with any other solution like RDP or VNC or yeah, basically anything. So they use SSH as a tunneling protocol here, which is actually quite smart, we think. Um, however, we found something that went wrong. Um, have a look at the configuration of the SSH uh, server on the end central system. Maybe some of you already spot something that is maybe a bit dangerous here. Just scream it in. I think we don't have really time to go around with the microphone because we are quite short on time. Anyone? Maybe if I highlight it. <laughs> so the problem here is uh, the asterisk because what this permit open line actually does, it allows the agent to do a local port forwarding of any port of the end central server. So we can actually forward any local port of the end central server also to the agent system. And this is a problem um, because let's consider the following scenario where an attacker already has gained control of some agent system. Maybe somebody lost their laptop. Um, and the attacker has then access to this private key, this temporary key that has been deployed during a uh, remote control session on this agent system. And then he can use this key to forward any local port from the end central server to its own system. And there are many services running on this end central server, most of them not even exposed to the internet or the, the network at all. But with SSH local port forwarding, we can also forward ports that are only listening on localhost. Um, so in this case, we forwarded the Postgres uh, database port, which also brings us already to another vulnerability because we chained those two together here. So we can then issue a Postgres command uh, and request, for example, all the uh, password hashes from the database um, because we now have access to the database because it's not secured with any password because they thought we do not expose it to the network, so why secure it? But those two vulnerabilities chained together then gives you full access of the entire database. You can also write to it, of course. You can add new users. You can probably compromise the whole web application with it. All right. Um, the next thing would be when we are on the system, again, to get a privilege escalation. So for this, we have a live demo. Did you share this video client? No, this is video. Okay, so imagine we compromise the web server. We are already on the system as the enable user this time, and it will look familiar because we are trying to do a pretty similar way. So we are on the system as user enable, not root, and we want to get root. So let's see what the sudo's file has for us this time. It's another keyboard layout. <laughs> so if you can see down there, the user enable is allowed to run the following wrapper script um, with root permissions and again without providing any password. So let's have a look what the script does. And um, if you can see here on top, there's a whitelist defined and also the script was called something like wrapper script. So you can immediately think of what the script does. So they try to implement some sort of whitelist commands that you can uh, execute as root, and if you have a look at all the commands that are allowed to be executed as root, you will see that there's quite, um, they're quite lax, so to say, with their whitelist. So you can see here, for example, there's a change password command, uh, who am I here, and probably some more things like, um, let's go. This one was really interesting, um, a, a tool or a command called Sombra, which maps to something called shadow.pl, and even more. Let, let's have a look at how they function. Um, so let's try running sudo. 
And let's first try it with the me, which mapped to who am I, remember? So with this, we can actually just run commands as root. Uh, we can also try the Sombra thing, which was mapping to shadow.pl. And you can see that we are just outputting the shadow file here. Really long. <laughs> and then there was also this change password command, which um, I think was uh, like this. So with this, you can just invoke this change password command. We can just reset the root password with this. So afterwards, we can then log in as root, take this password, and voila. <laughs> so uh, quite similar to the other vulnerability where they just didn't uh, pay enough attention with all the privileged commands this restricted user can run on the system. All right. All right, so um, yeah, now we saw one way to obtain root privileges on the system. Now let's talk about the N Central Administration Console, the NAC on port 10,000. That's the interface, just so if you uh, maybe so have seen it in some time. And um, yeah, let's just dive right into the next demo. Um, no, maybe not this one. My screens are different now. Sechs. Sechs is it. Die sehe ich hier gar nicht. Okay, this is really strange, <laughs> okay, but it works. Okay, but I can't see my... No. Okay, this is what we want, okay. So um, on the server, we uh, recovered this nice password recovery module.java file. And what you can see here, there's some really interesting names in it. So something like enable admin password, root password, admin password again. And you can see that there's stuff with uh, SQL in there, so this is one way we found about, out about the database. And um, there's also this interesting string here, oh, actually here that says, reset shell account and NUC account to default passwords, which indicates there's a default password, great. Um, and also we have this, um, this SQL statement here where this looks like a username, the enable admin at enable.com. And when we scroll to the bottom, we see the declarations of, of uh, the variables. And we have this root password with password hash and stuff. But we also have this enable admin password that's just like plain text. And um, yeah, let's, let's try this. We just found some credentials. Let's try to put them into the uh, NUC and see what happens. So this is the username. And then let's take this. And um, oh, yeah. We admin now, great. Um, so short disclaimer on this one. Um, of course, it's possible to have this password changed. But there's two accounts that use the same default password, and both are accounts that are not commonly used by the people who bought the solution. That is, this is support accounts from Enable that they use to support customers of their solution. So maybe it's changed at some point, but in our solution, we had only a trial version, but uh, official trial version, and it didn't get changed in there. So the default password just works, and you can log into this NUC as admin. And it gets even better, because um, now that we have an active session, um, we have to retrieve the cookie, because we just got this login cookie, and we have prepared a nice request for you. And I mean, it already looks uh, kind of suspicious, you know. Uh, we have this uh, file name equals dot dot dash dot dot dash and so on, bin bash min minus c id. And yeah, if, if I put the uh, cookie in there and we have this at run scripts endpoint and I just fire this command, and yeah, now, now we're root. So uh, basically. <laughs> Yeah, basically, there is just in this advanced script, normally you get a list with the scripts you may execute, but you can also st just specify one, and the password allows you to execute arbitrary code, and the NUC runs as root. Um, also, you might have noticed this is a request that is a post request that is state changing. You can do some severe stuff with that, and the only authentication or security part is this single cookie. So this is also not optimal, maybe. Um, OK. so. Yeah, what's also yeah. interesting here, um, we now have this root code execution, and um, this is from the security white paper, and also what you need to do to have the server running, and it just states that port 10,000 has to be 
reachable from the internet. So your firewall has to be configured in a way that this port of this server is reachable from the internet um, because of licensing stuff and so on. So yeah, this is um, interesting. So we have seen multiple ways to overtake the system now, and um, yeah, multiple combinations allow yeah, root access. Um, so this wasn't too good, but still we really want to highlight that um, them using SSH as a wrapper protocol is pretty, pretty smart because some other solutions that we will talk about later um, actually implemented some custom protocols and they're on their own, and SSH is more secure. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Okay, so now, Dennis. Yeah, on to the next solution, which is Ivanti DSM, where DSM stands for Desktop and Server Management. So this is, again, a full-blown management solution uh, meant to uh, remote administrate all your devices in your network. And also, just a quick disclaimer for this one, we didn't spend that much time with Ivanti DSM. We didn't have a full-blown test environment uh, where we had access to the central component. We only had a system where the agent was running on. So yeah, we did not spend that much time. We found two vulnerabilities. The first one was an insecure storage of credentials. And for this one, I want to show you a little snippet that we found in their code, which I guess also, if you're a security researcher, it makes you interesting and probably um, you also suggest that you will find something if you find something like this in, in the code of the agent. Um, so actually what, what was done here is in a configuration file they had stored AD credentials for a sensitive um, Active Directory account um, that the solution needs to operate and they um, encrypted it. And the encryption type was uh, the script conventional and we digged into it and basically it boiled down to being a blowfish encryption with a hard-coded key in this agent um, and some more obfuscation around it. But it was possible to reverse engineer this and to basically reverse it so that you can then decrypt those credentials in this file. And this file is uh, readable by Okay. It's readable by um, everyone on the system. So if some um, malicious user or some attacker gets access to some workstation where this agent is running on and does not even have to be administrator, uh, he can read that file and he can extract those credentials and then do lateral movement in your whole AD. Um, also, we found another vulnerability, which is an unauthenticated buffer overflow on the agent. So the agent also exposes network ports. And um, basically, with this, it would potentially also be possible to uh, get code, of, uh, code execution on the system. But um, yeah, that's too much for this talk. So this is, this is it for Ivanti. We, we don't have that much time, and we want to spend a bit more time on the next solution, because there we actually put a lot of time into. All right. This uh, next solution is called Broadcom Atomic Automation, or somebody might also know it as UC4, which is the old name. Um, and this is a very, very complex and um, very big job scheduling and automation solution. Um, it's developed by Atomic Software and was later acquired then by Broadcom, so currently it's owned by Broadcom. And yeah, it's quite complex. You see there's a lot of components involved, um, and we also only looked at a few of those um, and did not even look at everything. Um, so the things we focused on were the communication channels between the agents. So here with this solution, we have agent-to-agent -agent communication on port 2300. Um, we also obviously have agent-to-engine communication. An engine here is just the central component, this, this gray box here. Um, where, where it says automation engine, everything here, every component is basically part of the central server. And um, then there was a third thing we were interested in, which is this service manager component. Um, yeah, this looked also pretty interesting. Um, all the other stuff we didn't really look into yet, um, but there's interesting stuff there. For example, we noticed that this uh, worker process uh, actually runs COBOL code emulated in some C++ uh, program, which also looks really interesting. Um, yeah, just so you know. But uh, this is not for this talk, unfortunately. Um, so the service manager was chronologically the first thing we looked at. Um, it's a pretty old component. Um, it's usually running alongside the UC4 agent, um, so on the same system, and it's um, also starting the agent, basically. So it's meant to start and stop services on the system, and therefore it has high privileges, and it also exposes a network port. And on this network port, it speaks a custom binary protocol, um, which had a lot of problems, where we cannot go into every one of those problems. But we picked out one specifically, which is the custom authentication mechanism they implemented, and we found a way to bypass it. 
And this then obviously gives, gives you uh, unauthenticated um, code execution as root because this is a high privilege process who can start uh, processes. So the authentication works like this. It's basically a password authentication where uh, once a packet is received, the packet has a password field which is extracted and then compared to a password stored in the configuration file. And if this matches, then the packet is processed and everything is fine, it's allowed. If not, there's another check. Um, so next, uh, the solution will basically decrypt the message password uh, field from the um, packet and then compare it to the configuration file. So there is the possibility that the password field can be decrypted with RC4 or encrypted with RC4, basically. And then there's the problematic third case, which looks like this. So basically, this decrypted password field is then interpreted as timestamp and compared to the current time, plus or minus 10 minutes. And if this matches, then the packet is also accepted. And the problem is that the code or the, 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 hard, the key is hard-coded, basically, for this RC4 key stream. Um, we found this in, in the binary of the, of the agent, basically. And um, yeah, with this, you can always bypass um, the authentication of this whole solution when you know the current time of the server and then have unauthenticated RCE as root. All right, so that's enough for the service manager. We continued to look at other parts of this big component. Um, so next will be the agent-to-engine communication. So when the agent communicates with the central component. Um, there, there will also be a, another protocol um, that's a bit more advanced. It has encryption capabilities. And um, the problem we found here was a weak key generation, basically. So this protocol is an agent-initiated connection, basically. So the agent connects back to the automation engine who exposes the port. And um, the protocol supports encryption with 256-bit AES. And the key generation basically was the problem here. So let's have a look at it. So this is basically the part where this transfer key, so they call it, is generated. And they generate it as four times eight bytes, which then adds up to 256 bit, obviously. And um, yeah, we have to look into this built into key function how some portion of eight bytes gets generated. Um, the, the output will obviously be stored in this key variable. So um, internally, in this built into key function, it calls this generate random number function to generate eight bytes of randomness. And this calls just another function, gssgetRandom, which gives uh, eight bytes of randomness. And then it does something more. It basically masks the eight byte uh, variable with a 31-bit uh, bit mask. So that actually entropy is lost here. So because this is done four times in a row, this operation will basically reduce your 256-bit key to only 124 non-zero bits. And this is already the first big issue, but it gets worse. Um, when we look into this get random function, this GSS get random function, how it generates eight bytes of randomness, we found that it every time it is invoked will reseed the random number generator. And the reseeding will be done like this, where we seed with the current time in seconds. And now remember from the beginning, we call this function four times in a row, which probably will happen in the same second. So everything will boil down to the same number. So we only end up with 31 bits of entropy, which is definitely too less. And we can also show you this when we decrypt the key store, which is lying beside the agent. The decrypted AES key just looks like the thing in red here, which you can imagine is pretty easily break, uh, brute forceable. It's even brute forceable offline because when the agent connects to the central component, the central component will speak first with an encrypted packet. So you can brute force it offline. All right, so far for uh, this communication channel, obviously this then opens up a big attack surface, but we cannot go into that further because we have this third uh, communication channel that we also want to highlight and uh, put into this talk. So the agent-to-agent -agent communication on port 2300. Um, uh, for this port, they don't use encryption again, which is another problem. Um, it's the port where the agent communicate with each other. And we have to say a few words about the agent. So the agent is running as two processes on a system. One is hyperlitched, running as root, and the other one is the listener process running as nobody and exposing this uh, TCP port. And they speak with each other um, through a protocol and through Unix uh, network sockets, basically. And this protocol is actually the same protocol um, that is also spoken on the network layer. So the UC4 protocol between those two processes is the same as the protocol that is spoken on TCP. Just remember that. 
And the protocol looks something like this. It's a bit weird ASCII-based protocol that's also containing binary in the payload then. Um, the important part is just the, the protocol um, can be specified. So this protocol is um, capable of carrying sub-protocols like the NAT protocol, the GSS protocol, or the IPC protocol. And um, that's basically what you need to know for this talk. Um, we were first focusing on this IPC portion because this sounds awfully a lot like inter-process communication. And remember, those two processes communicate with each other over the same protocol, so they probably use this IPC. Um, what we found out is that the listener process actually also accepts packets from the network that have been tagged as IPC packets. And the IPC message handler on this listener is pretty trusting, let's put it like that. So this is actually the worst case message handler we found. Um, where the attacker basically controls the blue message buffer. And what you can basically see here is the attacker directly specifies a function pointer and three arguments, and then this gets invoked. So this is direct code execution unauthenticated over the network. And we can also have a demo for this. Let's hope we find the correct shell. Let's maybe zoom here. This one is it. <laughs> OK, so um, we have the following setup. Um, up here, there's the agent system. This has the following IP address here, so the dot seven. Um, down here, we will have an attacker system um, where a listener is uh, be running. So this will capture our reverse shell. And here, we will uh, for also from the attacker system um, trigger our exploit. And the exploit will just deliver this payload to the system which is basically a reverse shell. So we can see here that the reverse shell immediately um, triggers, and we are now running as nobody on the system. Remember, the listener process is running as nobody and not yet as root, but still, we get unauthentic code execution on the system. All right, um, let's go further with this. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah, this was the CV. <laughs> um, so now we got RC as nobody, but of course we want to get RC as root. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind, we got the listener, nobody, UC4 agent itself runs as root. So we have, we have to find some way to talk to the agent process, process itself, because that's the only way to get root privileges here. Um, so far, we looked at the protocol message itself. We also, by the way, looked at the NAT and the GSS messages, and both of them had problems in the handler, and we also found vulnerabilities there. But um, now, since we want to target the agent, we have to be a bit little smarter. So let's look into the payload, because the payload is all it's an important part of Broadcom Atomic because this actually is a really, really mighty solution that can do a lot of interesting and really complex tasks, and all this happens in the payload. So what we found is that there is um, yeah, a combination of an IPC message and uh, a NUT message that we can abuse here. So there exists an IPC route NUT message. What this does is I can send an IPC message to some system and say, hey, this is a route NUT package. Please route this NUT part to another system, and you can specify which system. And the other one that's really interesting is the xactj. It's execute aktiviere job. <laughs> because it's German names, some part. And this allows to execute jobs on systems. And this XFJ thing has two vulnerabilities that we need. Um, on the bottom, you see the schema of this. So basically, we have this IPC route NUT XFJ package from the outside that gets to the listener, and the listener relays the NUT XFJ part to the agent that is running as root. Um, yeah. Also, we only need one of the vulnerabilities if you use this in default configuration because per default authentication is disabled for executing jobs. Um, okay, let's talk about the first vulnerability that we have to exploit if authentication is enabled. What you see here is the etc password and etc shadow file of a standard Unix system, and the important parts here are highlighted. So in the etc password file, you see that in the second column, there's an X. What the X basically means, hey, there's no password in here, look into the shadow file. And um, you also have the last column, which is the login shell of the user. Um, I highlighted the one for the bin user because we will exploit the bin user because they actually prevent you can't authenticate as the root user, they just had a hard check there. So we used the bin user. And 
the, the login shell is no login here, so we shouldn't be able to execute any code. And also the shadow file, um, there the password column starts with an exclamation mark. This means uh, password login is disabled for this account, so we shouldn't be able to log into the account via password. And the problem here is what they do is they check the shadow file and see if the password field is at least three characters long. And if not, they just assume there's no password set in the shadow. And then they look into the password file. And in the password file, they basically do the same. They check if the string length of the password from the password file is smaller than three. And if so, they check if the password that you have provided also has a length of zero because then it's fine, because there's no password set for the user. You didn't send a password, so of course you're in now. Um, so yeah, that's how authentication works. And, um, but now we can only execute code as the user bin, for example. So the question is, how do we get root code execution? And probably there was other ways, but the way we found was this. So if you execute a job on the system, you are allowed to specify the path of the job report file. And the job report file ho holds the logs of the uh, job execution. So after the job is executed, the log, uh, or if, if something went wrong, is written to that file. And what they do here is that they invoke a file create in a process that is running as root and didn't drop privileges. And afterwards, they invoke change own, so they change the ownership of the file you specified to the user you just authenticated as. So now we have a primitive that allows us to write a file into arbitrary locations as root, and afterwards we get ownership of the file and can change the content. And this is a problem on systems that, for example, use Anacron or cron jobs, because we are now able to just drop a file into cron hourly and then we get the ownership, we change the content of the file, and this gets executed after one hour as root, because Anacron doesn't care if the file belongs to root or not, it's just executing this as root. Um, so yeah, this is the second vulnerability we're exploiting. And we also have a live demo for this. Okay, so hope this works. Uh, okay, so we have to quit this uh, nobody shell because we want to get a better shell. So again, we have this reverse listener. Still, Was we have. Nach oben. Hmm? Nach oben hier schon? Oh yeah, true. Yeah, we have this uh, reverse handler again, and we have the same IP as before. But now let's also have a look at um, the etc cron hourly directory to see. Okay, this is empty, and it belongs to root, and only root can write there as it is on normal systems. So we didn't change anything. So what we do now is that we. Um, use this exploit, targeting the IP of the agent, and we again have just a remote uh, a reverse shell. So if we execute this, uh, I will walk you through the payload a little here. Can you see that? Yeah, I think so. So um, as you can see here, this is the server greeting, um, the server, uh, oh, sorry, the agent greeting, the agent identifies as Unix01, and we are sending an IPC message here. And it's a route nut message, and the target of the nut package should be the agent via IPC. So um, then here's some packing, and this is the exact J part that starts. And here you can see that we specify um, the job report file in etc cron hourly slash some job name. This is where we specify the user, and there's some null bytes somewhere there. There's the password, and there's a lot of other stuff that I won't explain now. It's was quite the complicated exploit. And this is um, interesting as well because here we can sell a job shell. So normally everything gets executed with uh, the user login shell, but we can just say, hey, for this job, please just use the SH shell. So we come over this uh, no login shell issue. And um, yeah, what we now see is that there's a file in etc uh, cron hourly, and this file belongs to the user bin, and it's executable because we marked it as executable. And now we have the problem that um, this is an hourly cron job and we don't want to wait an hour, so let me just set the time for you. Um, okay, and while we wait, also look on the bottom left for a root shell. While we wait, I can show you the content of this cron job file. Oops. So you can see here this is just uh, the reverse shell um, and we're doing some cleanup afterwards. So um, yeah, hopefully this shouldn't take too long. It varies a little because cron jobs are not on the second precise, it's always within the minute, mm -hmm. but it should happen during the next few seconds, hopefully. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> All 
far right. So yeah, and of course, this is the server, uh, the HTTP address, so that's really the system we, we got here. All right, so uh, yeah, now we got RCE as nobody and also RCE as root. Um, so yeah, let's get into the summary. Right, so we have seen four different solutions now. Overall, I think we spend around two to three months of total research time on uh, those solutions and obviously spread across two years now, I think. Um, and we got assigned 18 different CVEs and not even every issue we found got assigned a CVE. There were multiple different attack chains which had really high or critical severity. Um, so yeah, that was quite impactful, I would say. Um, we also identified uh, a lot of common things between our solutions. So one big thing was uh, the issue with trust, which we already heard today in the keynote, I would say. Um, so those are distributed systems, obviously, but they came from the same vendor. And the agents are, in general, trusted, I would say, by, by the central component. Like, they still do authentication, but the, the overall uh, solution trusts all of its component, basically, a bit too much, which uh, leads to a lot of uh, security issues. Also, what we found out, basically, what we can say about those solutions is that the central management server is always a single point of failure from a security perspective. Just as with your domain controller in an Active Directory, if an attacker can get access and compromise your management server, he can get access to all of the system in your network. And we always have the problem that the vendor has to make a compromise between a solution that is easy to use and also very secure, which is quite hard because we all know the struggle. Convenience and security don't go well together. So this is a problem. And we also tried to figure out um, repeated uh, patterns that the solutions did wrong. So we, we call them security anti-patterns here, but basically it's just best practice violations. And uh, a lot of this can also be just uh, referred back to the keynote we heard today already. So we had hard-coded secrets at multiple places, weak defaults, as, as Fabi just said, the UC4 agent does not even have authentication on by default. You have to actually set it to on. Um, we have usage of unsafe function. Um, we have lots of custom cryptography, which is never a good idea. And also those custom protocols we saw are a problem because they are not as proven as uh, protocols we know, like SSH, TLS, and so on. And yeah, it's probably not a good idea to implement your own protocol if you're not knowing exactly what you do. Uh, also, there's a problem then with IDS systems, which cannot really analyze this traffic, and the IDS is basically blind. The attacker can just use uh, the solution, which is pretty, pretty convenient uh, to communicate through your network. And overall, we found that um, a lot of those components have very old code in their core, so this, there's a significant technical depth. Um, where the old stuff is still running and just wrapped around um, with some layers of security and layers of features. But once the attacker is able to communicate with this old portion of the solution, then everything falls apart suddenly. All right. All right, so let's get into the recommendations. What can we do to change this? So first of all, some recommendations for corporate IT and management. So what could you do to secure this? So. First of all, make security a main feature, because if this is a major sales point, companies that make these products will actually invest more. And you should always keep in mind that if you choose to buy a smaller feature set, your attack surface is also significantly smaller. So this means if you think about monitoring versus management solution, if the monitoring solution suffices for your yeah, for what would you need? Then take the monitoring solution. You don't need that, all that management stuff that's just adding to the attack surface. Also, the least privilege principle. Um, the agents, per default, run at really high privileges. But if you only want to execute tasks that need lower privileges, or maybe you can uh, work with capabilities or stuff, just keep the privileges as low as possible. It's really not good design to have this highly privileged pro processes on every system in your corporate IT. Um, and in general, we recommend a technical security evaluation before buying a product. And for this, it's really important that um, you then have to reevaluate your security assumptions because having such a monitoring or ma management solution changes a lot about your corporate IT network that you're not aware of, maybe. So first of all, you're building network bridges that were not there before because those systems speak across borders, across network zone borders. Also, um, the agents and the whole system might compromise your AD tiering model because those agents sometimes even run on the DC or stuff like that. So this might just affect the tiering model. Um, 
And also, as Dennis pointed out, custom protocols cannot be monitored by IDS oftentimes because, yeah, well, it's custom. And um, this makes it really hard to keep an eye on what is happening with those solutions. Um, okay, so um, what should you do after buying the product? Yeah, first of all, still be aware of the security implications I just talked about for before buying a product. Um, then you should really set your solution and all the agents to the strictest possible security settings uh, because, yeah, the defaults are not that good oftentimes. Um, you really have to have access controls as tight as possible. This means really only people that absolutely need access to the central components should get it because basically this means their domain admin can do anything. And also, you should really closely monitor those central management solutions. And by this, I don't mean by another monitoring solution to monitor the monitoring solution, uh, but you really have to have people that understand how the solution works that can automatically extract the log files and look at the logs and understand what's happening. You really should be able to see if there's irregularities because most IDS systems can't really do that for you and it's really tough to see what is okay and what not for a machine. Also patch management, like those solutions do this for you for the endpoints, but also patch the solution, it's important. Um, okay, so for vendors and developers, um, really the most important thing is get rid of legacy components. Offensive capabilities have really increased a lot since 20 years ago, and the old security measures you had back then don't suffer anymore. And an intermediate fix could be to wrap custom protocols in TLS with authentication. This doesn't fix the problem, it's still unsecure, but at least there's some more of an obstacle to get to that and to speak to these vulnerable protocols. Um, in general, of course, just use the secure software development lifecycle that should be given, but currently we're only using this for newer stuff. And you should also revisit all your old components because just wrapping your old core in new fancy APIs that are super secure doesn't matter if I can still talk to your old core because it's still insecure, it's still using these hardcore keys. So really, you should really rethink this and refactor your old code base for all these solutions. Okay, to conclude, we saw that, um, yeah, these are highly complex systems that is, it is really tough to secure them, actually. And there's a really nice talk by Daniel Gruss. This was a Black Hat Asia keynote talk. Um, complexity kills security. We can really recommend you, you watch the talk. It's really funny, and he really has an important point there because the complexer a system, the, the, more, yeah, the more impossible it gets to guarantee that it's secure. And this is already right for a single system where you maybe understand the security at some point, but those solutions are always distributed systems where multiple components interact with each other, though you, you don't only have these complexities of these single components, but you have the complexity of the networking as well. So this is really hard to secure. And all these capabilities and the problems with security make them a really attractive target. And you have to really to think about it this way. If someone finds a vulnerability or is able to compromise your central component, this is a supply chain attack because he has full control over your whole network. And if we would want to covertly compromise your network, we actually would target those solutions because this is a ready-made command and control infrastructure you can simply use and it's so hard to monitor. And yeah, we want to uh, close this talk with a statement that's actually not from us, but we uh, yeah, we, we think this is a good statement, and it's from Nagios. So what's, what they say in the security considerations is, your monitoring box should be viewed as a backdoor into your other systems. And, well, yeah, that's basically it. You should think about it this way. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, time. thank you. Are, you. are there questions? If not, maybe I can ask one. Um, for the um, UC4 agent, um, I mean, you had in the IPC protocol that you can specify a pointer. So mm -hmm. uh, this was a real pointer into the program, so they didn't have ASLR enabled? Um, they didn't have ASLR for their base part, so no uh, PEA. Um, so the system that it was running on basically uh, was our own lab system, so it had ASLR enabled, but the program, the agent itself, didn't have ASLR enabled, so it was easy. When you know which agent, which version is running on the system, it's easy to exploit. And the, the agent greets you with its version, right? Yeah. Okay.
Are there other questions? If not, uh, let us thank the speakers again. <laughs>